I wonder what is left for me to say after Admiral Dillo Chahan speaks. And when I known that he was, you know, preceding me, probably I had never invent, you know, accepted this invitation to be speaking here. But having said that, uh, Vice Admiral Chauhan, Admiral Kannan, Admiral Shravat, the CWPND, DGND, Commodore Samadhar, ladies and gentlemen in the audience. It's a pleasure for me to be here. Uh, and it's a very interesting uh, topic this time for the international seminar on nation building through shipbuilding. And I must thank the FIKI, uh, the Navy and the NMF, who is the knowledge partner for this, for organizing such a topical seminar uh, on, on, on this theme of nation building through shipbuilding. This is obviously aimed at uh, arriving ideas to promote shipbuilding in India. Number of uh, lacunae in the existing system was brought out by Admiral Chauhan. Uh, and Admiral Kanan also mentioned that uh, there is a connection between uh, the Navy and the merchant shipping. Uh, of course there is. If I were to go back in history, uh, you will realize the inextricable linkage between Navy and trade. In fact, in this uh, very interesting book uh, called The Price of Admiralty, uh, written by John Keegan, I don't know how many of you have read it, uh, he says that the very birth of navies was to protect trade. And thereafter it evolved into anything else. So, uh, it's quite a nice book. And so far as trade is concerned, there are prehistoric evidences of India trading. In fact, Admiral Lamba mentioned Lothal in the Arab civilization, where there was a repair yard. Uh, similar in the case of Kodugalu uh, in the Kerala coast and also Baipur. The boat construction even to date uh, goes on at Baipur. <coughs> trade was immense between Harappa and the German civilization. You know of Maurya's uh, trading with the Greeks uh, in BC. Cleopatra's uh, Egypt uh, dealing with the Pandyas and the Chodas on the uh, southern coast uh, of Tamil Nadu and, and many many such examples. Uh, Hippolos's first uh, uh, route, direct route from the Gulf of Aden uh, to India without going through the Omani coast and the Makaran coast uh, is even referred to in the uh, Periplus of the Eritrean Sea which is written sometime in the first part of the first century AD. So trade was immense. If you, if you moved into the 80s, you, you also found that there was trade between uh, the Chodas and the Fatimids of Egypt and the Mings of the China uh, of Chinese. Uh, very interesting fact, in 1025, Rajendra Chola even launched a naval expedition uh, to, to sort out the Sri Vijay Empire in Indonesia because they were tending to levy additional taxes on uh, the trade which is passing through uh, the Malacca Straits because they control the entire Malacca Straits. And similarly, uh, if there was a drive by the Europeans to find the direct sea route uh, to India, it is because, and it is not that the trade did not exist before, there was sufficient trade between Egypt and India, and also with China, the old silk routes and the maritime silk routes and so on and so forth. But the reason behind why they wanted to find trade route was because of the politics which is there on land. Passing the Gulf with today's Middle East, was the problem even then too, after Islam had taken over. The regimes which are there were charging additional taxes on the trade which is passing through. Therefore, they tried uh, to find out a, a direct ceiling. If you read the book, The Splendid Exchange uh, by William Bernstein, it clearly explains as to why, uh, how this, this whole thing changed the world. Now, why I mentioned all this is because today, if you see uh, the the uh, UNCDNA report of 2017 says there's 10.7 billion uh, tons of uh, goods which is transported by sea, which is about 90% of the total trade in the world. And this is likely to continue. 70% of Earth is at the end of the day covered by sea. And the ease with which you can go uh, over the seas, you can avoid all the political compulsions of land, uh, is what makes sea. Uh, the ideal uh, medium for transportation. It's also cheaper and it's also faster. I'll come to it slightly later. If you were to come to the modern times, I, I spoke about cheaper and faster. Uh, if you were to look at huge amount of investment which is now happening 
for infrastructure creation in so far as say pipelines for transporting oil and gas or highways for trade uh, especially say through the BRI project for Chinese one of the uh, things that is quite revealing is that a simple calculation makes you realize that the cost of transportation of oil through pipelines is about four to seven times that of transportation by ship. And similar is the case, the, the effort it takes to transport, say, uh, containers over uh, road as compared to sea, uh, you all can realize how uh, easy it is over sea. In fact, I must give you this example which I have given earlier too in, uh, in one of the other seminars. Is this that in, uh, I think it was in 2017, November, that in order to prove the CPEC, the Chinese ran about 100 trucks from Kashgar to Quetta and about 70 from Gwadar to Quetta in order to prove the uh, road linkages. And we are talking about 170 containers. You can imagine uh, the latest of Maya's container shipping. How many containers does it carry? and how many trucks would you uh, require to transport these number of containers. So, why I mention this is the fact that sea will continue to remain as the preferred medium of transportation for at least uh, quite some time, till then some new technology emerges. Therefore, the need for us to concentrate on shipping. Uh, shipbuilding is an industry, now world industry is again replete with examples of shipbuilding nations becoming economic giants. Whether it was the British before, uh, say in the 19th century, or the US post Second World War, or Japanese uh, between say 60s and 90s, Korea was mentioned uh, post 90s, and Amir Khan mentioned till the time the Chinese uh, uh, overtook them. So all these are classic examples of nations which have concentrated on shipbuilding going on to become manufacturing hubs and becoming economic giants. So this is one aspect that we need to keep in mind. And for any nation, since economic well-being and the security of its people will always be the highest priority, and which also gets them votes and you know helps them in elections. So this will remain a high priority for, should remain a high priority uh, for the powers that be as well. Now both CNS and I recall the Fiki uh, president yesterday brought out as to how shipbuilding helps nations and that's the very theme of this uh, seminar as well. Now the CNS brought out three things which again uh, I will kind of reiterate uh, of uh, the plowback effect or the uh, employment generation effect or even the uh, you know multiplier effect he called it. Now when it comes to plowback effect if you just look at the navy alone uh, in the last five years, over 70% of our capital orders have been to Indian uh, Indian companies, whether it's ships or even other equipment and systems. So that just means 70% of our capital budget has been ploughed back into the economy of the country. Similar is the case, the case with capital, uh, with revenue as well. And if I were to mention about the multiplayer effect, you know there are it's any ship. Is a, is a complex array of equipment, machinery, systems and so on and so forth and therefore the upstream uh, effect on industries such as uh, steel, aluminium, electrical and so on and so forth uh, is huge. It was also mentioned about the capital, the capacity assessment that we have completed. I, I uh, have noted Admiral Cannon's point for uh, follow-up uh, but what has happened is that each of the shipyards which is today available in the nation the capacity assessment has been carried out by the team of CWP and his officers. And therefore, uh, that enables us to kind of streamline the process by which shipping contracts would be avoided. It may not be easy uh, with the government to get, say, 15 ships uh, acceptance and necessity like Admiral Shravat brought up. It may well be 3s and 2s and 4s and 5s. But the fact is that the the MCPP, which is an approved document by the government, is by and large known to the shipping industry as well. So at the end of the day, it might take, say, 15 years, but we will still go ahead for those 15 ships that we want. Maybe in threes and fours, but it will happen. There are a number of government policies which, or concepts, uh, you know, which, which also have provided the renewed focus to the maritime domain. 
If you ever mention about Starweb, for example, security and growth for all in the region. And as I see, security is the Indian Navy and growth is the Merchant Navy. So if you're looking at in the region, the Indian Ocean region, these two aspects are completely maritime. And today, because of uh, uh, Sagar, the Indian Navy, as you're aware, has tweaked its method of deployment to mission-based deployments, which helps us undertake a lot of foreign cooperation initiatives as well, which helps us to be the first responder to various crises that comes up across any nation in the uh, Indian Ocean region. And that foreign cooperation has also helped us to ensure that for anything they come running back to us. We have provided enough assets to various countries. The AOPVs which are constructed in GSL are the mainstay of the Sri Lankan Navy today. We have provided to Mauritius, Seychelles and in fact uh, very soon during the Honorable Aram's visit there will be uh, interceptor boats which will be handed over to one of the African nations which will happen probably next week. There are other initiatives like the Sagar Mala, which is port-led development, or the Blue Economy, or the Project Mossam. Everything is maritime in nature. Now, the government, as I understand, and it is also highlighted here, has also revived the grant of subsidy to the shipbuilding industry. And shipbuilding and ship repair has been given the status of infrastructure sector, which I understand helps shipyards eligible for long-term funding at lower rates. There are numerous of the policies as uh, were also thrown up here yesterday uh, when I was in attendance here, uh, such as the Make in India, Buy IDDM, Buy Indian, Buy and Make Indian. All these initiatives actually help us not only encourage Indian industry uh, to kind of flourish, but also helps our own GDP by plowing the money back into our GDP. Uh, I'll, I'll stick to the seven minute formula that Admiral Shavat uh, lined out, so I'll now try and conclude it. So this seminar, as I understand, has been an ideal platform for uh, uh, each one of us to brainstorm uh, pertinent issues when it comes to uh, shipbuilding. Admiral Chavan brought out a lot of lacunae in the existing uh, system towards encouraging the shipbuilding industry, but I'm sure the number of uh, points that have come out in these two days will get converted into a uh, into a proposal which hundreds or thousands that uh, we might have uh, come to realize in the last two days and will be taken up uh, quite pretty strongly uh, by uh, by this forum. Now at the end, while a thriving shipbuilding industry is the need of our heart, I must just only mention one thing, quality, cost and timeliness will help the industry grow from strength to strength. Thank you very much.